All right, engineers, in this video, we're gonna talk about internal respiration. So if you guys have already seen our video on external respiration, that's good, because then it's gonna help us to make sense of this, because we're just gonna do a really quick recap of the external respiration so that we can kind of feed it into internal, because we have to understand one more concept. So really quickly, if you guys remember, we have this red blood cells that are coming through the pulmonary capillaries, right? They're coming through the pulmonary capillaries where the alveoli is, where the gas exchange is occurring. And if you guys remember, just really simply, which gas was moving which way? Oxygen was moving from the alveoli into the blood, and then CO2 was moving from the blood to the alveoli. That was the simple concept. And then really quickly, we said that again, you have an alpha chain, alpha chain, beta chain, beta chain, two alphas and two beta chains for hemoglobin. That's hemoglobin A1. We also said that he had four iron containing heme groups in the two plus state, the ferrous state, not the ferric state. And we said maybe it was only bound to like one oxygen at that point in time. So maybe it was only bound to one oxygen. But it was bound to a lot of CO2 and a lot of protons, we said, right? We said that the CO2 could have been bound on to the actual amino uh, acids within the actual globin chains, because you know globin is just proteins, right? You could have CO2 bound to it. And we said that that CO2 that was bound onto these actual globin chains was gonna account for 20% of the CO2 that our body is actually transporting in the actual blood. And that was in the form of carboamina hemoglobin. We also said, and then we did it with this uh, nice baby blue, that we would also have protons. And these protons are positively charged. So we said that there's certain amino acids on this actual beta chain right here. And these are actually negatively charged. So these are negatively charged. Now, if there's negatively charged amino acids here on these actual beta chains or alpha chains, then they're going to interact with these protons here. And when they interact with these protons, these protons bind on to the hemoglobin. And again, we said that whenever this is happening, whenever protons and CO2 are bound on to the hemoglobin, it's in the deoxy state. But just an easy way to remember that, what do we say was the deoxy state again? It was the T state. I just like that because it's easier to write. It's in the T state. Okay which just means it's deoxyhemoglobin, not too hard to remember. Then what else did we say? Well, we also said that there was a certain site, right? There was these uh, positively charged pockets uh, uh, due to certain amino acids, right? We said certain amino acids, which could be positively charged amino acids, could be like histidine, could be like arginine, could be like lysine, whatever it might be. But we said that there was two comma three BPG, which was a glycolytic intermediate, it was also binding into this site. And it was stabilizing this hemoglobin in the T state. Okay, this was our deoxyhemoglobin. Okay, so now, what else did we say? We said 20% is in the form of, C, uh, the CO2 is actually present in the form of carbamine hemoglobin. What was the abundant of it? It was in bicarbonate. Remember 70% of the CO2 was hidden in the form of bicarbonate? So let's say here's our bicarb. And it's actually very abundant within the plasma. That's where it's usually gonna be to control our actual acid-base balance. We said that the bicarb, though, was doing what? It was moving into the red blood cell. And then in order to counteract that uh, electro neutrality, the negative charges moving in, we have to have negative charges going out, and that's called the chloride shift. Then what do we say? We said that the bicarb did what? It interacted with these protons. You know these protons that were right here? These protons did what? They actually come over in certain situations, and they combine with our bicarbonate. When would this be happening? This would be happening in which a situation in which the hemoglobin's affinity for the CO2 and the protons and 2 comma 3 BPG is decreasing. And we'll see why that happens in a second. But then this bicarbonate, right, that we have it brought it in through this chloride shift, combine it with the protons, we get H2CO3. Then H2CO3 can disassociate into CO2 and water, we said, in the presence of an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. And that CO2 right here is the CO2 that we actually have hidden in the form of bicarbonate. Then what else did we say? We said the remaining about 2 to 10% of the CO2 was going to be dissolved in the actual blood plasma, about 2 to 10%. And then what do we say? We said, okay, this was our deoxy form. But then we explained the concept of positive cooperativity, that whenever the oxygen is moving from the actual alveoli and into the blood to bind onto hemoglobin, the first one might bind, but it has a hard time. But then it opens up the pocket for the second one and makes it even easier. So that when the second one binds, it's an even easier binding site, right? So remember we explained it kind of like this. 
We did it like this, guys. We had the little boom, 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 boom. We had the four pockets. When the first oxygen binds, it was hard. But then whenever he binds, he opens up the pocket of the second one even bigger. So he made it even bigger pocket so that the next oxygen's easier to bind. When the second one binds, it makes the third pocket even bigger. Right? So then when it binds them to this one, it's even huge, right? It's, it's big sucker. And then that third oxygen binds even easier. But then when the third oxygen binds, what do we say happens with the actual fourth site? The fourth site gets even bigger so that the fourth oxygen can bind on. That was the concept of positive cooperativity, right? And this is our hemoglobin molecule, which you can think of like the crown, right? That's what's happening. So when the oxygen starts binding, so this oxygen is going to start trying to do what? It's going to start trying to bind on to this hemoglobin molecule. We're going to have a lot of oxygen moving down its gradient. From what? Well, it was a partial pressure of oxygen of about 104. And we said what? The partial pressure of oxygen in this area in the blood was 40. And 40 what? Millimeters of mercury. 104 millimeters of mercury. So we said it's going to move down its concentration gradient from areas of high concentration to low concentration. And we said it'll start binding on to the iron-containing heme groups. So let's say that we show this then. Let's say that we go from the T state to now to this new oxygenated state that we talked about. And again, that was called the R state. You guys remember that? And again, let's have our iron-containing heme groups in here. Iron-containing heme group, iron-containing heme group, iron-containing heme group. But now in this situation, a lot of oxygen started binding. Remember there was the oxygen lo uh, loading? And then what was happening? The CO2 was being unloaded. The bicarbonate was coming in and getting converted into CO2 to be unloaded. The CO2 that was dissolved was being unloaded. Then what happened? The structure of this uh, hemoglobin molecules changed, and the positively charged moieties weren't exposed, so 2, 3 BPG couldn't bind, right? So now let's show how all of that happens here. See that, C see that CO2 that we had over here? Remember the bicarbonate? So let's show that now. Let's say here's the CO2, and it leaves, right? So that CO2 that we actually had originally, what happened to it? It leaves. So look, this CO2 here, it's going to leave. Where's it going to go? It's going to go into the alveoli. This CO2 that we got from the 70% of the bicarbonate, guess where he's going to go? He's also going to go to the alveoli. This CO2, that 2 to 10% of it is actually in the dissolved plasma, he's going to go into the alveoli. So all of this CO2 moves from the blood into the alveoli. Now the question is, what is the normal partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli? Remember we said it was about 40 millimeters of mercury? And then what do we say it was here in the actual blood? We said it was only a little bit different. It was like 45 to 46. So we said, oh, that's not a big gradient. But what do we say? CO2 is 20 times more soluble in the plasma and the alveolar fluid. So it's going to easily move. So CO2 starts leaving the hemoglobin and going into what? Going into the alveoli. Now, when he moves from in this direction, now we have to understand something. These oxygen molecules are going to start really, really binding on to this hemoglobin molecule. Look at this. We have all these oxygens bound on now. So now the hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen has gone really, really high. That's why it's in the R state. Remember I told you before we showed it like this, that the legs were crossed. And when the legs are crossed, what happens? Those positively charged moieties, the actual 2 comma 3 BPG can't get into it. So it can't stabilize this hemoglobin in the T state anymore. So look here, let's say here's 2, 3 BPG. He's repelled. He can't get in there anymore. CO2 is not here anymore. H plus isn't here anymore. Because again, these are what? This is my alpha chain. This is my alpha chain. This is my beta chain and my beta chain. There's no CO2s. There's no protons. There's only oxygen. So in this guy, what was happening to the hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen? Hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen was decreasing. Decreasing affinity. Over here, the affinity for oxygen is increasing. So then in this deoxy state, there's a decreased affinity for hemoglobin. In the R state, there's an increased affinity for hemoglobin. Okay? And we said in general that whenever the CO2 is moving and being unloaded and the oxygen is being loaded, that was defined as the Haldane effect. Okay. One last thing, and then we're going to go ahead and get into this internal respiration. Okay, let me get this out of the way because here's what I want you guys to understand. You know, gases like to move, like we said, from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. But when do they stop? How does a gas know when to stop? Okay, so let's say I take, for example, here, my partial pressure of oxygen was 104 millimeters of mercury, we said, right? And we said over here, the partial pressure of oxygen was only about what? It was about 40. What's going to happen is the things are going to move from areas of high pressure to low pressure. So when this oxygen starts moving from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure, 
it's going to continue to keep flowing into the blood until the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood equals the exact amount of the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. So in other words, what would that be if it leaves and it goes out and it goes into the pulmonary vein? So now look, we're separating it by this dividing line. Now what would the partial pressure of oxygen be after this exchange? It should be that of the alveolar partial pressure. So it should be approximately 104 millimeters of mercury. So this is after the exchange occurs. Let's do the same thing for CO2. CO2, the partial pressure of the CO2 in the alveoli is 40. The partial pressure of CO2 in the blood is 45. It's going to move from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. So as it's moving from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure, it's going to continue to keep moving until the partial pressure of the CO2 in the blood is equal to the partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli which is exactly what? If it moves from air, uh, 45 millimeters of mercury to 40 millimeters of mercury, and it's gonna move until it equals that pressure, it should leave out at what? The partial pressure of CO2 should be approximately 40 millimeters of mercury. Okay? That is extremely critical that we understand that. So whenever the actual blood, the red blood cells, are leaving the lungs and they're getting ready to go out into this area, which is the systemic tissue. So now we're going to go out to the peripheral tissues. We're going to deliver these oxygen to like the muscles, the heart, different organs of the body. We need to understand that whenever it's leaving, the partial pressure of oxygen in that systemic arterial blood is 104 millimeters of mercury. And the arterial, uh, arterial partial pressure of CO2 in the systemic arterial blood is 40 millimeters of mercury because they're moving until equilibrium is reached. Okay, cool. So now we take this actual red blood cell, and it should be exactly like this red blood cell. And it's going to the tissues. Let's just say, for example, these tissues that we're taking it to, let's say we're going to your muscles. Okay, so let's say this is going to the muscles. So this is going to your skeletal muscles or your cardiac muscle, whatever one. And again, we should say that specifically, what should this hemoglobin look like? Well, he should be in what state? That should be the next thing we should think about. Well, he should be in the oxygenated state. We said the oxygenated state is the R state. Cool. Let's do that. R state. Done. Okay. And I like to write R state because it's just an easier thing to writing oxy hemoglobin. Okay. So now, boom. There's that guy. There's that guy. There's that guy. There's my irons. And now all of these irons should be having oxygen bound to them. So this should have an oxygen bound, this should have an oxygen bound, and this should have an oxygen bound. There shouldn't be very much at all CO2 bound on any of these globin chains. And again, what is this globin chain here called? This is a alpha globin chain, beta globin chain, beta globin chain, alpha globin chain, right? And again, what is going to be right here? You're going to have these. Remember, he's crossing his legs. His legs should be crossed. Okay, should be crossed, and if they're crossed, what does that mean? That means that these positively charged moieties, those positively charged amino acids, aren't exposed so that 2 comma 3 BPG can't bind. Okay, cool. Now that we have that, this is our oxyhemoglobin. Now, watch what happens here. This is cool. I get excited about this stuff. I'm sorry. Now, the partial pressure of oxygen in our muscle cells at rest, at rest, the partial pressure of oxygen should be about 40 millimeters of mercury. Okay? All right. In the blood, it's 104. It's 40. Oh, crap, wasn't that the exact opposite in the lungs? Yes, it's going to be the same exact thing. If you guys really understood what happened back there, it's going to be the exact reverse over here. But it's a good recap. So 104 millimeters of mercury, 40 millimeters of mercury. <laughs> now, if this is 40, what do you think the partial pressure of CO2 is going to be? probably going to be the exact same it was over there. It's going to be about 45, 46. Okay, so the partial pressure of CO2 is going to be about 45 to 46 millimeters of mercury. So now, gaining that concept, where would you expect the oxygen, where would you expect the CO2 to move? Well, they have to move from areas of high concentration to low concentration, or in this case, high pressure to low pressure. Well, it's higher oxygen out here, less oxygen out here, it's going to move that way. So oxygen should move in this direction. Boom. Okay. Okay, what about CO2? Well, CO2, the pressure for CO2 is higher out here, lower in here. Oh, it's going to want to move from this area to this area. Okay, cool. So it's going to move from the tissue cells to the blood. That is the simplest definition of internal respiration. Okay, so now we have the understanding of this simplest definition of internal respiration. Now we have to see exactly how this oxygen is leaving and where this CO2 is going.
and it's going to be so simple now. Okay, let's keep these oxygens here for a second. We'll come to them in just a second. Now watch what happens with this CO2. Where is this, how is this CO2 coming? Like where is it coming from, from the muscle cells? Like do we just like blast CO2 out for like from nothing? No. You guys understand that um, within metabolism, we take glucose, right? So C6, H12, O6, plus oxygen, right? And technically six oxygens. And whenever we break this down, what do we get? We get a total of six CO2 plus six water. So we have C6H12O6 plus six oxygens yields six CO2 plus six water. And that should help us to understand that this whole reaction here is occurring. This is our cellular respiration reaction, right? Now, as this actual CO2 is being produced from the cellular respiration process, metabolizing oxygen, producing CO2 and water, the CO2 is moving out here from the cells into the blood. When it moves out, you already know what can happen. It's the exact reverse of what happened before. So let's say that out of this CO2, we know 2 to 10% of it does what, guys? It should be dissolved in the blood plasma. Okay, so dissolved in plasma. Okay, cool. What about the other parts of it? Well, remember we said about 20% of it was doing what? 20% of it was actually coming over here and binding onto the amino acids of the alpha or the beta chains, right? So I could have a CO2 molecule right here, or I could have a CO2 molecule right there. Or if I want to, there could be an amino acid here, and I could have a CO2 bound there, and a CO2 bound there. That was what we said. And we said that this was in the form of, this CO2 was in the form of carboaminohemoglobin. So again, what was it called? Carboaminohemoglobin. Globin. Okay. Then, what about the other 70%? Okay. The other 70%, if you guys remember, what's going to happen to it? Well, we said some of it can actually get taken into this actual cell. So let's bring the CO2 in here. What is most of our cells containing? Out of these cells, what is the most abundant substance usually in the cells? You know, water is really, really abundant in, the, in these cells. So now look at this. So now if we look here, what are we going to have a lot of? we're gonna have a lot of CO2. What's gonna happen with the CO2? I'm gonna combine this CO2 with water. When CO2 and water react, look what happens. I form carbonic acid. But again, what enzyme had to be present in order for this reaction to run? What, is, what enzyme is involved in the reversible reaction here? This is called carbonic anhydrase, right? Now carbonic anhydrase is speeding up this reaction. But then we said what happens with this H2CO3? We said it's very unstable and it disassociates, right? Into what? H plus, which is our protons, which are acidic, and bicarbonate, right? Where is these protons going? Well, you guys probably rec uh, recognize the protons being in that nice baby blue color, right? So we probably recognize them like this. Where is these protons gonna go? Oh, I remember Zach saying before that there was negatively charged amino acids on, you know, on these actual uh, alpha or beta chains. So those protons can actually bind on them to them through electrostatic interactions. So there could be a proton binding here. There could be a proton binding here. And they're just being bound by these electrostatic interactions. Okay, cool. So I know where my protons are going. My protons are going right there. What about this bicarb? Because we said about 70% of the CO2 is hidden in the form of this bicarbonate. Well, where does it go? Remember I told you that it has to go out into the plasma because it's acting as our buffer system in the blood. It has a really good pKa that matches pretty darn close to our uh, blood pH. It's within a you know, plus or minus one difference. It's really good for the blood plasma. So as the bicarbonate's moving out here to go and control different types of uh, situations with the acid-base balance, what has to come in to counteract that? The chloride. And what is this called again? This is called the chloride shift. Okay. Then what do we say? Okay. When the protons bind onto the uh, different amino acids of these globin chains, and when the CO2 binds onto the amino acids of different globin chains, guess what happens to this hemoglobin? So originally he was in a good structure. He was holding on to the oxygens, right? But then whenever the CO2 bound on, imagine like, imagine like this, the CO2 binds onto my hip, I do this. Then an H plus binds over here in this hip, and I do this. Then another CO2 binds over here, and I do this. 
and then an H plus binds over here and I do this. I'm all the way fricked up, right? So because of that, my whole structure is changing. What happens when CO2 and protons are binding on, it changes the shape of the hemoglobin molecule to where it stresses, it puts so much stress on this bond between the iron and the oxygen. And that bond breaks because it's just, it's not, it's weakening it so much because it's changing the overall shape. It's allosterically regulating it. What happens to this bond then? This bond breaks. And what happens to these oxygens? They disassociate, they leave. And where does the oxygen go? Not CO2, oxygen. Where does this oxygen here go? This oxygen that we're pushing out here, these oxygens here, that we're breaking the bonds and releasing out here, it's gonna go to the tissues. So this oxygen right here is gonna go where? Because this oxygen right here is gonna go into the tissues. Same thing like this oxygen. You see this oxygen right here that we were showing with the diagram? So this, what happens again, whenever CO2 is binding on, whenever the protons are binding on, it changes the shape of the molecule in such a way that it actually strains this bond between the iron and the oxygen, and then oxygen leaves. But then you know what happens? When oxygen leaves, he opens his legs. Okay, so when he opens his legs, what happens to this then? Look at this, watch this. He opens his legs, now keep your minds clear. Okay, he opens his legs and look what comes in here to bind. Two comma three BPG. When two comma three comes in here to bind, two comma three BPG, what do we say it does? It stabilizes the hemoglobin in the T state. So this can't be in the R state anymore. This is now going to be in the T state. And that's what we're gonna show over here. So let's represent that quickly over here. Okay, so let's say we only have one oxygen again. And it's bound onto one of these iron containing heme groups. So here's my one oxygen that I left over. All the other oxygens left. Then what else did we say? We said that we have CO2, remember alpha, alpha, beta, beta, before the uh, blue was alpha, but it doesn't matter, you get the point, okay? Now CO2 is bound here. We said CO2 could also be bound here. It could be bound to any of these different amino acids, right? And this was 20% of it was in this form. Then what do we say? We said we have bicarb. Remember that bicarbonate through that special transporter? That special transporter was doing what? It was moving the bicarbonate from the red blood cell out into the actual blood plasma. And because it was moving out, we had to balance that shift of negative ions leaving, so we bring negative ions in. That was called the chloride shift. Then we said that bicarbonate was coming from what? Well, it was coming from H2CO3. Remember H2CO3? He was breaking down into two things. Okay, so now, this uh, H2CO3, when it gets broken down into bicarbonate, and we also said that it can get broken down into what? H pluses. What do we say happens with those protons? Remember we said that those protons start binding on to these negatively charged amino acids on either the alpha or the beta chains, it doesn't matter. Again, here's our negatively charged amino acids. So if we have those negatively charged amino acids, where are these protons gonna bind? They're gonna bind right here. And when these protons start binding, what do we say? We said it decreases the actual affinity that hemoglobin has for oxygen. Oxygen unloads. When the oxygen unloads, right, what else did we say? We said the overall structure of that positively charged pocket, the, the legs open. When the legs open, what else did we say? Those positively charged amino acids in that pocket are exposed for who to come and bind? Two comma three BPG. When he comes in and binds, now this hemoglobin is in, in what state? He is in the T state, the deoxyhemoglobin state, because the oxygen is going to leave. And where is that oxygen gonna go again? The oxygen that was released, let's just say that we had three of them, these three oxygens that we released out of this, right, from these iron-containing heme groups, where are they gonna go? They're gonna go from the actual blood to the tissues to be utilized in the metabolic process, right? To break down different types of molecules to produce ATP and to produce uh, certain types of heat, right? Okay, now, one last thing I need to explain. You know in your tissues, your tissues are actually, like I already said this, I didn't put it in the equation, but you know another thing that your tissues are also producing as a response to this, besides CO2 and water, you know they're also producing ATP. But as a byproduct from the electron transport chain, sometimes there's a lot of heat released. 
And if you guys remember something, heat is basically going to be like, we can use it as a measurement of temperature or thermal energy. We're not going to utilize chemistry, but delta H is the form of our thermal energy, right? Our enthalpy. That is our heat. That heat, we know a, a concept about proteins. Protein structures change when they're exposed to heat, maybe excessive amount of heat, or they're, expo they're changing when they're exposed to different types of pH. This protein is actually going to undergo a conformational change because of this heat that's radiating from the tissues. So whenever there's also an increase in heat over here, so let's come over here, you know where our cells are actually producing all that CO2 and H2O and ATP and heat? Some of that heat is also contributing to the breaking of these bonds. So let's account for that. So we should also account for the heat, or we like to call it temperature, okay? Same concept here. What is this heat or temperature doing? it's also assisting in the breaking of these bonds between the iron and the oxygen. You know what this effect is called whenever you have CO2 binding, H plus binding, 2 comma 3 PPG binding, and also the heat and temperature which is produced from your tissues? This is called the Bohr effect. So what is this called? The Bohr effect. And the skinny on the Bohr effect is we could kind of like sum it up like this. So let's say what kind of like the skinny of the Bohr effect is. Because we already went over it in detail, but just to kind of outline it, because that's what we did for the Haldane, is that for the Bohr effect, what the, the hemoglobin coming in to the actual uh, deliver the oxygen and the CO2 to the tissues, right? The, the, the exchange that was going to occur between the tissues and the blood. We said originally the hemoglobin affinity for oxygen was high, but Whenever the CO2 started binding onto the hemoglobin, whenever the protons started binding onto hemoglobin, whenever it changed its shape in 2 comma 3 BPG, stabilized it in a deoxy state, and now what it could do to temperature and heat produced from our tissue cells, it changed the overall structure of the hemoglobin to cause oxygen to disassociate from hemoglobin. It broke the iron to oxygen bond. So now the affinity that hemoglobin has for oxygen decreases. So now the affinity hemoglobin has for oxygen decreases in the Bohr effect. Then what happens? Hemoglobin's affinity for CO2, protons, 2, 3, BPG increases. And the whole point of this is, what's the whole purpose of this? If hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen decreases and its affinity for CO2 and protons and 2 comma 3 BPG increases, then these should be loaded onto hemoglobin, these molecules, they should be loaded, and then hemoglobin should unload the oxygen. In the same way, let's explain that with the Haldane effect, in the same concept, it's the exact opposite. So now in the Haldane effect, to have this skinny on this one, the Haldane effect, the hemoglobin that was coming to this area in the lungs originally had a high affinity for oxygen because, uh, I'm sorry, the, the blood that was actually coming to the lungs with the hemoglobin, it had a low affinity for oxygen, right? Because it's coming from that point there. It's coming from the T state. But as the oxygen starts moving down its gradients and binding onto the iron containing heme groups, the affinity that hemoglobin has for CO2 and protons and 2 comma 3 BPG starts decreasing. So, right? So, hemoglobin affinity for CO2, protons, and 2 comma 3 BPG decreases because oxygen is binding. So, as oxygen starts binding because of its partial pressure gradient, then hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen starts increasing. Right, because of positive cooperativity. So now, if that's the case, then hemoglobin doesn't want these guys anymore. So these should be unloaded, okay? And then the affinity for oxygen is increasing, so he should be loaded, okay? One last thing. So whenever the blood is actually going to be leaving this area, so let's say that it underwent this movement of oxygen where? From the blood to the tissues, and then what happens? CO2 moved from the tissues to the blood. Well, just to go off of what we did over here within the lungs, we have to do the same concept. So let's assume that right here we're leaving and we're getting, we're, we're draining from the capillary bed. And as we drain from the capillary bed, we're going to go onto a vein. 
What would the partial pressure of oxygen and CO2 be as you're leaving that area? So now, let's look here. Let's say, again, the partial pressure of oxygen in this area was 40, because we're, we're taking consideration that this is resting tissue. Then let's say that the partial pressure of CO2 was going to be, again, what? What do we say? We said that the CO2 was going to be producing a lot, there was going to be a lot of CO2 production from the cells. So it's going to be about 45 millimeters of mercury. Then we said the oxygen coming through this area were, was really high. It was about 104 millimeters of mercury. Whereas the partial pressure of CO2 was kind of low, about 40. But again, remember that it's 20 times more soluble than oxygen in the plasma and the alveolar fluid. Where's the gradients showing us? It's going to go from here to here, and this is going to go from here to here. But at what point does it stop? It stops when this happens. Look. So now let's say that it's leaving and it's going, now it's going into the veins. Let's say, like I represent here, it's going into the veins now. So over here in this part, we're going into the veins. Now, the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood, in the blood here, okay, so I'm going to put B for blood, it should be equal to the pressure of the tissues. Why? Because the oxygen should keep moving from the blood into the tissue spaces until the pressure of oxygen in the blood equals the partial pressure of oxygen in the tissues. It's going to keep moving until equilibrium is reached. So now the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood should be 40 millimeters of mercury. But that should be, again, in here, in the blood. Then what about the CO2? Well, you know this CO2 is going to be moving from high concentration to low concentration, or specifically high pressure to low pressure. Until when? Until the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood equals that of the pressure in the tissues. So it should keep going down until the partial pressure of CO2 is approximately 45. So the partial pressure of CO2 in the blood should be equal to 45 millimeters of mercury. And again, this should be in the blood. So I can even represent it here if I really want to be very particular so that you don't get confused and think it's out here in the tissue spaces. This should be 40 millimeters of mercury and the partial pressure of CO2 in the blood is 45 millimeters of mercury. Okay, and then that'll go to the lungs. And when it goes to the lungs, what happens in the lungs? When it goes to the lungs, what do we say? Here is the partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs, right, in the blood, specifically in the blood. Partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. Partial pressure of CO2 in the blood. Partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. What's going to happen? It's going to move what? From areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. Until what? Until it, when it leaves the actual pulmonary capillaries and goes into the pulmonary veins, it should be. Partial pressure of oxygen is equal to 104. CO2, though, he's going to move from areas of high pressure from the blood into the actual alveoli. Until what? Until the partial pressure of CO2 in the blood equals that of the alveoli. So it should leave as, in the pulmonary vein blood, as partial pressure of CO2 equaling 40. And that same concept, the blood will come back at 40 and 45 when it undergoes the internal respiration process. All right, engineers, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope it all made sense. If you guys did, please hit the like button, comment down in the comment section. We really do look forward to hearing from you guys. And please subscribe. All right, engineers, until next time.